It is Saturday the 1st of October 2022. Welcome to The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Hey everybody, how you doing? And hi Jeremiah, how are you? Good, very good. Uh, alive and kicking here in California. And um, it's a nice, soft lit, cloudy day. At least for the morning. Anyway. Well, sounds um, delightful. Yeah, it's been very hot the last month, and now it's cooled down to its regular mid seventies, and we love it. So we're good. <laughs> is that you set for the autumn and the winter then, and through yeah now is that? Yeah, September, October could be um, our hottest months generally here in Southern California. Oh, okay. But, uh, I think we've moved past that, and then you know it doesn't get obviously too cold here um but uh yeah we're we're uh we're good we we are um you know we're a progressive state and we're holding the line that's what <laughs> i want to say well we're, we're we're a progressive state here in the uk as well this week we've progressed to being a post-economic state but there is, this right. isn't a politics we're progressed to a developing nation state <laughs> we Very are yes this is that's uh, that's only according to the IMF, and what would they know? Anyway, moving on, moving swiftly, swiftly, swiftly on, because this is not a politics podcast. No. Well, neither is it a meteorological podcast. Although maybe we could do one of True those that. at some point because it could be could be interesting. My my daughter went recently on a residential school trip, and they spent part of one night stargazing, and they had what seems to have been a really inspirational you know, uh, person come in and talk to them, and then take them outside with some big telescopes, and she came home full of life talking about how they saw jupiter and the moons and stuff like that so maybe well, we should... by the way uh, weather itself and photography are very connected because of the quality of light that exists naturally um and the sh shifting dynamic of light over the course of a day does influence how we take pictures what we set um in terms of exposure how we capture weather or not avoid or capture how we replace skies all of that a subject for another day yes absolutely i do i did so uh, one of those things isn't it if you build your own studio you you build it with a north facing windows if you possibly can <laughs> get some lovely north light into the into the movie. Ah. but uh, hey or as I, we I, say english light <laughs> english light well uh, do you know what it's actually quite bright and contrasty here at the moment um it's it's not far from well it's probably you know uh, uh an hour and a half or so before sunset here so it's got some quite nice like warm contrasty light outside at the moment anyway we uh well as much as photography is about light um it's not the light that we're here to talk about because I don't know. I, I'm not sure what to expect this week, Jeremiah, because you brought the you brought the topic this week. And I don't know whether we're going to have a rant, which might be fun. I don't know whether <laughs> we're going to have a scratchy head discussion, which might also be fun. Uh, I, we, where are we headed with this? I, I, I'm feeling more scratchy head than rant, because um, while we can opine on it, um, the subject I've brought is what is it about grain? Ah. Um, both in terms of. Do we like to avoid it? Yes, sometimes. Do we want to increase it? Definitely sometimes. The relationship of how we use grain um, in terms of uh, film photography, um, how we add grain to digital photography and why. Um, so what is it about the nature of grainy photographs uh, or lack thereof um, that is part of the aesthetic and our emotional response to a photograph uh, over the course of, you know, a hundred years. Because uh, today we find in our new digital cameras, which are grain-free and in many cases noise-free, because there is a big difference between noise and grain, uh, though sometimes they are conflated visually, um, that... We, we basically embrace grain in a nostalgic way, often. And that nostalgia kind of creates a, an emotional funnel for us to respond to an image. So if one looks at what we would consider a cold digital image, crisp, 
add grain to it, often that provokes a, ah, it's a photograph. <laughs> I don't know why that is, and that's what we'll talk about. I think there are a lot of metaphors or, you know, straight line comparisons to when CDs came and digital recording came about and the the lack of clicks and pops and scratches and that warmth that we got, and I use warmth um, in a both literal and figurative way of listening to a uh, LP. Um, and there's a lot of uh, obvious, you know, uh, musical geniuses who go, oh, there's nothing like listening to something on a wax disc. <laughs> Don't think they um, make them out of wax anymore, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how they began with all their flaws. And, oh, yeah, and absolutely. Oh, a wax and, cylinder. And just, I do like yeah, to get it, a wax cylinder out and put it on the gramophone. It, it, it may be because it messes up all the waves and that really comes into our ears the way we normally hear. Um, it's an interesting the, thing. I remember hearing, you know, uh, a pure, you know, uh, sine wave or a pure so sawtooth, you know, from early synthesizers when I was a kid and thinking, oh, that sounds really unnatural. Uh, and that's which which is which is interesting, isn't it? Because it's it's very pure. And I, I've often wondered whether it's just, you know, the the that sense of well-being or that sense of warmth some people refer to it or even just the sense of sort of an organic sound comes because it's it's a mishmash of different things and that's what I our brains you, are used to I, I think you've hit, hit an interesting uh, word organic and, and um, you know when we listen to remasters digital remasters and we go oh listen we can hear that player deep in the background isolated and it, now I think it gives us a, a different appreciation of the music than if we listen to it mashed up with the original, say, four-track recording. But the four-track recording was the intention of the producer at the time. It may have been the only thing that they had, or it could be very retro. Now, you know, taking a line into photography, um, I myself add grain a lot. Um, almost all the time, I had a little bit of grain. I think it's because my aesthetic in photography um, evolved um, and was born in the uh, in the world of grain. And I remember when I first started, I was very captivated by shooting Ilford thirty two hundred ASA film and <laughs> and pushing the process and and having that rendered as very textured and and the textured photograph maybe felt more like a it had fingerprints on it it was flawed even if the focus wasn't right the grain was sharp the, there was an aesthetic born there that felt very organic it felt that kind of messed up quality um was a maybe a pure connection to the, um, I don't know, the, the quality of the image. Whereas if I went uh, and currently see a Gursky hanging, I don't want to see any grain on that. I, <laughs> I, I want to see a window to uh, reality through his eyes. Uh, so the lack of grain becomes um, part of the aesthetic on film. Um, and the kind of celebration of grain. Also, um, Moriyama, good example of a Japanese photographer who, whose grainy images of street dogs, whatever, black and white, really does render a quality of aesthetic. So I circle back to my original question. What is it about grain? that creates a an aesthetic that we both want to avoid often and add often it's that's a it, it is interesting and it because the aesthetic of course the grain would only be one element of it you know for me the the it, part of it is is about taking it away from reality i think part mm -hmm. of it but and and similarly with with colors as well you know if you 
uh, either shooting something that is you know it is digital uh, and then playing with the colors after it or, or shoot it or choosing a film emotion emulsion because you like the color treatment or these days of course we would see we would call it the color science of course these days wouldn't we <laughs> that, uh, 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 that's that's within that film uh you know and you know uh, we've talked often uh occasionally i suppose rather than often about the the app hipstamatic which we we both know and love uh yeah. and you know that that is anything but realistic um so for, I, I think you know just thinking about what you you'd asked there and thinking about what, what what is it about grain i do i do feel that sometimes i like to add some sometimes i like to take some away for years i'd shoot hp5 for example only uh, in medium format because mm-hmm. i felt that it was too grainy in 35 mil uh nowadays actually i'm not so fussed about that because it has its own you know I've, maybe i've come round to it right and said okay you know that's something that i can enjoy uh in certain specific you know uh, imagery um when i shoot digital uh i tend to yeah shoot my fuji cameras often i'll have a, a jpeg engine setting on those that adds grain because you can add yes. different levels of grain in fuji cameras in modern fuji cameras these days to the jpegs uh and sometimes that's great sometimes it's, it, it's less appropriate uh so i think is it so, so the, the the thing i think of i know that the thing that you added grain for example to and 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 quite some layers of processing to your uncanny valley series of images sure. and when i think about that and when i think about the, the the what i tend to do i think it is almost to it's almost for the same purpose for me that to remove an uncanny valley feeling even if it so something that is too where the colors are too close to reality and where the imagery is too sharp i then get this funny feeling sometimes that oh that's just a 2d representation of a 3d world and it's very literal very exact very precise very accurate representation uh and actually for me i don't think photography is about uh, a precise capture of the real world I, I i like the interpretive element of it and sometimes for me part of that interpretation is grain does that make any sense well yeah i i do agree that that adding grain um does create a, an aesthetic for me especially in my digital representation say of virtual street photography of making it appear more real whatever that is or the response more real um, but again, going back to a, an example like Gursky, uh, whose large format grain photography is dazzling, would that same image, grain free, have the same impact as a you know if printed on a four by five, you know, I'm talking about size wise mm. um, print, you know, it would just look like would it look like a snapshot? outside of its composition or would it have the same impact as something that is 10 feet by you know, because you've feet. changed two variables there you've changed the graininess and you've changed the size because the gursky yeah it gursky stuff is t- tends to be rather large doesn't it um, and grain free so 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 both I, both would be grain free but the size and grain free aspect of it even if the colors seem to represent it reality the size of it creates a whole different uh perspective or um way of seeing the reality mm. it's tricky to print different. that big as well and and retain that level of quality uh, i remember mm-hmm. years ago seeing a batinsky show i think it was oil yeah, uh, yeah. and and the another great there, example the, yeah. the prints there the in that particular show uh were maybe three feet square a mm-hmm. meter square um and uh but they you really couldn't get too close to them because they broke down quite a lot and i don't know whether that was intentional or whether it was an artifact to shoot in i'm guessing you were shooting it on six by six film but um uh, but uh, uh, one could argue that perhaps it was intentional <laughs> well and he you know he comes from printing i mean i think he i could be dead wrong but if memory serves he he did run a lab or um, came out of printing primarily into photography. Um, 
his new work, I think he's using digital cameras now, but I think he evolved into large format. Mm. Um, not to have grain, you know, like like Kursky. I think there are, you know, Irving Penn in his eight by 10 portraits of Aboriginal people worldwide. Um, I think the very aspect of not having any grain and yet shooting black and white studio lighting decontextualizing people from their environment, again, created a, a, we'll call it a vibration between reality and unreality or interpretive reality. Um, so we can, we can maybe drill down a bit and say that grain is an element like color, like a filter um, that is applied to condition us or decondition us. Um, to the intention of a response. Uh, it's interesting in Lightroom, those of us who use uh, Lightroom, uh, there's, you know, there is a grain bar that you can slide more or less. It also is, uh, below that is how big, mm -hmm. yeah, how yeah. rough, how yeah. rough is the grain. So it's not just grain, it's what kind of grain. And, you know, if you're going to blow up a um, an image very, very large, um, you could have that grain really manifest, or you can make it so small that it's almost invisible and yet present. So it it is um, it is an aesthetic tool, and I'm always interested. I've never. I don't think there's an answer to this, um, which is why I brought this up. Of what is it about grain that evokes the response to an image? Um, is it because our first exposure, no pun intended, uh, to photography uh, is and was through relatively grainy work? I may be I may be wrong about that because if you look at early my early collection of say family photos that are quite small four by three five by four um they don't they seem to be quite grain free which is interesting um printed on very glossy paper with a little white board border often serrated which is interesting um so even the serrated edge became part of the aesthetic of a of an image, <laughs> and yet, you know, when I when I evolved as as a photographer, as an artist, um, like I said earlier, I, I was very captivated by grain by pushing it, and that kind of um, kind of uh, a spy camera, where I I went through a period of using uh, Minox, uh, right. yeah, yeah, blowing those up, a, a camera that I love, I still have my Minox. I don't know if you can get film for it anymore, but it you was can in this country, certainly. Yep. There's, a, there's a guy who main, mends them and maintains them and, and oh, works okay. only the films and tiny little metal good, good. In fact, I saw one the other day. Oh, and I'll tell you who it was. Uh, it was um, Jeff Greenstein, who lives just up the road from you and um, uh, does a, pub, a podcast called I Dream of Cameras. Uh, and uh, he had one. I met him in London a few weeks ago and he had one. Uh, crazy little thing. Lovely little thing. Yeah, uh, you know, so so again, when I did those pictures, I really was very um, enamored with the grain, although the grain didn't feel sharp enough. And it's always interesting to see a sharp photo with sharp grain or an unsharp photo with sharp grain. That, again, has a different... Um, <laughs> yeah relative exposure because we know if your camera is not perfectly fo uh, focused on your subject when you process it the grain is going to be sharp yeah uh, yes unless of course you're in larger isn't folk yes but but indeed. that's right exactly so that now that's really that's uh it, it, it's a it is a thing isn't it i it, it's sort of almost uh, crazy that people who shoot film which has a uh, you know a naturally occurring grain to it try to get rid of it and people who shoot digital add it back <laughs> you might just yeah. suggest that they swap <laughs> for a week right and see and see if they like yeah. what they're doing uh, uh, yeah it, it is interesting um again you know using my um 
like a monochrome, which emulates, say, the M6, um, like a, which if you use, say, an FP4, you know, a, you know a, a, basically an ISO 125, and blow them up to 1114, they're very sharp, and the grain is very, very minimal. And the monochrome is attempting to emulate contrast-wise and every other one with the chip into that black and white aesthetic that is really close. And if you add ever so slightly in Lightroom, oh, just a, a hair of grain, almost invisible to the eye, you can, you, I, I, I think you can't really tell the difference. But if you don't add a little bit, you can definitely feel, maybe not see, but feel the difference between a digital image and a film image. Now, I'm not really going on one over the other that is good, bad, or indifferent in terms of what is a better image or what is a better camera or what are, what are more effective film resources for us. But, but again, um, I'm always very, very cognizant in my own work of how much grain I add or reduce in order to evoke a particular response. And, and this is kind of near and dear to my heart right now because I'm working on a, um, uh, a series now, which is uh, originally driven in AI, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. Uh, I, and and uh, you know I may have talked about it, but but it, it really is about the interpretation of biology, organic material, interpreted through a machine, and rendered out in a very nostalgic old school print. Okay. So it feels so yeah, like, going to make physical prints of of the work. Yes, and and the prints themselves they look like they look like old photographs um, but of um, microscopic microscopic uh, organic material okay so there, there's a lot of different levels and they're uh, very much designed to evoke a kind of feeling on the organic aspect of our bodies, even though the interpretation originally was through a machine, couldn't be less organic. Uh, okay. And so, so that balance, which I need grain and, and flaws and things that are not quite focused to evoke the, the aesthetic of the early photograph, which itself has a objective, mm -hmm. um, is something that I've been playing with. All of these images are vi visible on my new website. <laughs> of course. Tin which I, I, I think I posted last week, tinroof.studio. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've been there, seen and, that. And under machine biology, uh, you could you could see maybe a hundred of these. Ah, oh, um, okay. Well, that's, that's <laughs> good news about AI-generated images is it can, be, it can be produced quite quickly at high volume. Well... These took about a month to make, so they 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 were not um, auto generated. In other words, it wasn't like pushing a button. Right. Okay. They began that way, and they were worked over and as you know treated and uh, subjected to a lot of um, um, in, enhancements. Not necessarily all photographic. Um, some of it mechanical, um, but you know that's. We've talked about that before mm -hmm. in terms of AI, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it again. Uh, but the point is that there is a relationship between the human and the machine, which could be our camera, um, and how we, um, how we live uh, with the uncanny valley. I, I noticed yesterday, I think uh, Elon Musk introduced his first robot, Mm. Uh, that Tesla will be building. And, you know, it's built in a humanoid form. Does it, why? Because we feel maybe a little bit uh, more familiar with that. <laughs> 
That's it. So, so, so the recommendation this week should be everybody should go and read some Asimov then, is it? And <laughs> <laughs> I robot. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I, you know, you could say, I mean, his dream is like, you know, a hundred thousand of these robots in every factory in the world, hundreds of thousands are freeing up mankind. Of course, when you have all of those people without jobs, uh, what happens, um, I don't know. Well, there we, yes, that's a d- discussion in itself, isn't it? What happens yeah, when the robots take away all the jobs? It's uh... Yeah. On the other hand, um, in his factories, repetitive mechanical jobs, which are very dehumanizing, I think, at a certain point, could benefit from mechanical help uh, and and then free the humans to do more evolutionary work, more fine-tuned. And of course, that circles back to education and how we bring up a, a generation of, of people whose thinking is less about uh, mechanics and more about evolution. Or we, we uh, interpret more kind of trade school to be able to fix those robots, <laughs> repair them and program them, because that is going to be a job in and of itself, too, exactly. unless we get robots to do it. So. But circling back, our cameras are a cold mechanism that we use to capture, hopefully, emotional moments or emotional concepts. That's... Yeah, I was going to say, are we going to then, sorry, I, my, my, my brain got completely <laughs> derailed and ran off in a different direction from this podcast. And I'm now thinking about how it is that we program the robots to add grain to their photograph. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, but it's, yeah, the, that's an interesting statement in itself that the, the, the camera is a cold item to, to capture a warm moment uh, with, mm-hmm. with, with hopefully some emotion. Is, is that where you see the grain playing in? Is it, is it, is it yes, appealing I- to the emotional side? Yeah, because it adds flaws. And mm. I think it comes to that, that as humans, and I'm, you know, God, I, I, I hope in our Discord people argue this ad nauseum. But, but I do <laughs> that think... That would be good, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I think by adding flaws, um, and there is a, a saying um, out of Islam that only Allah is perfect. And that's yes, why yes, in these absolutely. beautiful rugs, they will put in a, a deliberate flaw as, as a reference to that. Um, but I think by adding flaws, that very flaw is a connection between uh, the machine, the camera, the coldness, the perfection, yep. and our own foibles, failures, um, Mm-hmm. vulnerabilities um and that That's connects us concept. to is it, I think, and I think I'm inclined to agree. As you said yourself a few minutes ago, there's, there's no real answer to this, is there? It's, it's no. an exploratory, fun, yeah, open-ended conversation rather than the bit where we say, "Well, what does all this mean for the future of photography?" <laughs> it's X, Y, and Z. Thank you and good night. We're not going to get, to, yeah, we're not going to get to a conclusion of that kind. But I no. think the for, for me, I think uh, I'm inclined to to think of these things as in, as important. The 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 way my the, the way that I'm making photographs and other types of images at the moment is, is very much, it's not, I don't think of it as flawed, actually. I think it more of it as interpretation. Um, yeah, because uh, I th- it had a, I, I may have mentioned this to you, Joe, some, some months ago, I thought I, I was having a, a thought about some kind of fruit. Let's just say it was a raspberry. And I was like, how, if you take a photograph of a raspberry, how do you, how do you make it the most raspberry photograph of a raspberry you've ever, <laughs> that anybody's ever made? How do you make it so that when people look at it, they go, wow, that's a raspberry. That's what I meant. That's, the, that, that's <laughs> what I meant when I thought the word raspberry. Yeah. How do you, how do you achieve that? Cause it's certainly not by taking a photograph of one because that maybe it's painting up, it. It could be, but so I, I I might challenge that because I don't think because if you paint a a reasonably realistic image of a raspberry, or if you make a reasonably realistic photograph of a raspberry, people look. At, I, I think, at least for me, the response is going to be something along the lines of, "Oh, there's a painting of a raspberry." What I'm trying to get away from in this thought experiment is 
how yeah you know, how do you get away from oh that's a thing of a thing to oh wow that's a thing right yeah how you know the, uh, and the, the medium is the medium is yeah. transcended right um, well well m- maybe it's really not to paint a realistic image of a raspberry but to find the essence of raspberry ness yes which it can you do that what by adding gray <laughs> feels like to eat or experience a raspberry and and that is a very different aesthetic than the raspberry itself and and certainly we know i mean the, the you know uh, our 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 history of art is is you know certainly in the last say 100 years um you know from impressionism on that impressionism is is about giving us the feeling of woods storm uh, you know, nature, beauty, sensuality, history. It's it's not history itself. It's the feeling or the interpretation of of that moment or that particular object. And and going back to our initial um, kind of concept of, of grain itself is. Um, if there's if there's a benefit to anybody listening to our podcast, it, it's like to really be conscious of applying grain or using film that is grainy, um, maybe experimenting. If you're using a film camera, go out with uh, with with very fast film that that has a very loose grain structure, which exposes quickly. And a very sharp one, and take, you know, take some images uh, using both, process it the same, manifest them, imprint the same, and likewise in digital photography, take an image, look at it, apply filtration, you know, with one of many to add grain and and that kind of flaw. I'm calling it a flaw because if originally um, our our invention of photography was to capture reality, not interpret it. I'm not, I'm not sure that's true, but because <laughs> who knows? Uh, but but um, there there are uh, specific steps that you can take to add the grain in post or uh, with kind of your iPhone filters, and really compare the feeling you have from these images and start to get. Uh, conscious of what that means, like darkening a sky or using a polarizer um, or changing lenses even. You're going from a 28 to a 35 or a 35 to a 40. It may be a small thing, but it may totally recharge the image. So. Mm. Mm. Interesting stuff. Interesting. I, th- I think, yes, yes. And I think I can definitely see, you know, for, for me, it de- definitely as part, of, as one of the tools in the arsenal, regardless, you know, however you generate it. I have a whole, you know, it, it, I still have a whole bunch of other things that, you know, going through my head at the moment, picturing different images and the different types of, you know, whether they be, you know, film grain or, or digital grain simulations, you know, just un- and seeing sort of, mentally picturing those i think uh, on balance uh, uh i think i prefer the film grain to the digital grain as many mm. would i suppose it, it, in terms of a pleasingness of the aesthetic but it depends on whether you're trying to please people or not i suppose doesn't it if you're trying to shock people well, then maybe it's not that well what's interesting also it just occurred to me now thinking out loud is when we started using digital um cameras uh, you know, and I'm talking about early stages where you had like, you know, 200 by, you know, 100. So that if you blew it up, it became very pixelated, very blocky. Uh, and that still is an issue uh, in digital in terms of of how images are manifested with square blocks uh, and artificial smoothing of those corners, etc. But the whole 8-bit aesthetic came about for that. In other yes. words, what was a scene as something to overcome 
became an aesthetic in and of itself, which is, you know, 8-bit art and all the rest of it, which is very clever in terms of its minimalism. So um, I think if you look at, you know, the sky with a murmur of swallows or, you know, flying in these beautiful patterns, and you add green to that, they are, th there is something um, magical ab about that um, because they create a sort of an artificial grain in the sky and then you add that to it. So th there are levels of adding, call it noise or things that are not natural uh, to natural imagery, which may give us more of the feeling of what it meant to experience that nature at that moment, rather than just a snapshot, which is, oh yeah, I was there. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't have a fixed point of view about that, on, only to know that it's a question that um, I ask myself often, uh, how much flaw, what I consider a flaw, uh, to put into an image creates the intention of what I wanted in the first place. So how fucked up can I make it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know what? I think that's a good segue to, to picks of the week this week. Sure. Um, because uh, uh, the, uh, there, well, maybe some of our listeners know, know this already, but we're recording this, as I said earlier, at the start of the show on the 1st of October, which also happens to be the first day of Holger Week 2022. So I have here in my hand a Holger, uh, you know, replete with all of its tape to stop the back falling off and stuff like that. But, you know, as Holgers are not the, uh, the, 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 the most refined cameras in the world. Um, and just because we happen to have been talking about it, it has a roll of HP five in it. <laughs> so that's, uh, so my pick of the week this week is Holger week, not necessarily the, um, the, the most intuitive pick for a show called the future of photography, but I haven't participated in Holger week for a couple of years. And, uh, I think it, it's, it's a camera that I love, uh, and have some, uh, some of my favorite photos take over the years taken with the Holger. So, uh, in terms of, how distressed can a photo get? Um, I'm leaning towards the more distressed end of the spectrum this week. <laughs> and my, my pick of the week is, is shamelessly self-promotion. Um, as some of us may know, I've been working on a television show. No, no, you're um, absolutely entitled to this one. They go for uh, it. Called uh, Reginald the Vampire, which premieres this week on the 5th of uh, October here in the U.S. on Sci-Fi and then later on Hulu uh, in different territories on Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. Check your local listings, et cetera. So I put the, um, the trailer of the show is uh, in our picks, and um, I assure you it's uh, grain-free. <laughs> is it even though you shot most of it at night? <laughs> Digitally and beautifully rendered grain free so. okay brilliant uh, do you know what? i am um, i'm looking forward to watching this because yeah it's one of those things i feel it albeit uh, a little vicariously i feel almost part of it because we've been talking sure. about it for so long all the way through your pre-production work and, and production, production. and production yeah and i know not yeah. I, I know much of that conversation you know wasn't part of the the published part of the podcast but we've been talking about it for so long i'm really looking forward to watching it so well, I hope the launch goes well um, and uh, that it gets uh, the the critical ratings it no doubt rightly deserves. Actually, no, the positive critical ratings it no doubt rightly deserves, <laughs> I should say, just to qualify that. Let me just say that making it was, uh, was a miracle, you know, just getting it done. But uh, we're very happy with the show. And, uh, you know, it, nowadays it's not just about ratings. It's about social media. It's about viewers and recording and how much is you know watched afterwards and then the drops on social and the drops on streaming so you know with luck uh, it may even be renewed for a second season but we're happy with the first so there you go excellent well good luck with it all um and uh yeah look forward to watching it right i think that's us done then for this week is it um, it is yeah 
Okay, well, I enjoyed that conversation. It's always good to have exploratory conversations and uh, yeah, to indulge our creative sides. So, uh, well, there we go. That's the end of uh, the future of photography for this week. Um, uh, we'll play you out now with the music. Or at least somebody will when this gets any time. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.